Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Doing all right. Doing all right. Getting ready to ride out a nice uh, big ice storm here in Kentucky tonight. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm hearing you guys are getting some weather. Yeah, I would have to get the garbage cans off the street a moment ago, and I skated over to the side of the curb. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. I, I, I remember what that was like. I used to live in Canada. I used to live in Toronto. And um, Okay. Tired of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm a summer guy. <laughs> one day, it actually took me four hours. So I had a shared driveway with my neighbor, and one day it took us four hours, the four of us, to shovel the driveway. And that's when I said, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I, I work with uh, Mohawk College over in Hamilton right now. We're running an academy with them. And and so I've, I've been there in a few ice storms. And, and it's turned out that all the trips that I've made in the last few years, that it, as soon as I land and go to the hotel where I'm going to be, they say, this is the worst storm we've had in 20 years. And I'm like, that's always when I get there. <laughs> It's never been this cold I mean, without. It's, it's like you're a bad luck charm or something. Like I think that. so. I think so. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, uh, sorry for dropping the uh, C from your last name because I thought, wow, what a great – now that I know that it's Justice, I thought, what a great last name. You're, you're like a superhero, man. I, exactly. And and I come from Justice, West Virginia to beat it all. <laughs> really? <laughs> and I have, I have a great niece named Liberty Ann. Justice. <laughs> <laughs> so is the town named after you or are you named after the town? Is the town named well, after you? It, it's kind of after the family. Uh, it, in my great grandfather, I guess, came in there in the late 1870s and uh, was logging. He ended up, I think he ended up being a state senator or something before he was finished. But uh, so my parents and I, we had a, a motel there that started in 1964. And uh, so we, I grew up, you know, around that. And so we basically the, the town is the motel and the service station my dad started and maybe 300 other residents. And, nice. and uh, yeah, nice little area. It's, it's, it's well, you know, the Artie we, Bailey Dam. Everyone's going back to small towns like that now because, you know, with, with pandemic and people working from anywhere, you can go yeah. live wherever you want. So why, why spend $800,000 on a tiny little condo near the, uh, near the train station in a city when you can go to a, you know, beautiful wide open place like that and still as exactly. long as your internet is good why not right well i i have a little houseboat down on lake cumberland and uh, i work from there a lot of times in the summer <laughs> so you know that's that's my preferred place you know you, you don't you don't want to hear my analogy about you know living in a box to ride a box to work to go to work in a box to come home in a box to go back to your box <laughs> <laughs> i'm unfair to the city you, I heard a song like that. you live in a box you work in a box you die in a box it's like <laughs> yeah <laughs> I need to record that one sometime. I'm a little bit of a musician too. I'm in my recording studio tonight. Actually, it's where I'm at, but I'm not using my better mics. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> so, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your uh, organization and what you're passionate about, and we'll go from there. All right. Well, uh, again, to reintroduce myself, I'm Jamie Justice. I am a Director of Education at really North America and Global Innovation with Eon Reality. We are a software as a service uh, ed tech company now, officially. Uh, we've been nice. in business out of Irvine, California for uh, going on 22 years. Uh, wow. We are very prominent in the virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, but really XR is our main focus now with the XR platform. And uh, for, for me, it's been a journey uh, from about 2002 till now, uh, from when I worked in the Kentucky Community and Technical College uh, system as uh, Director for Workforce Development, Technical Education, ultimately Innovation and Professional Development. And, you know, started at that time uh, on a journey of looking for for ways that virtual reality can be used to uh, enhance and improve the teaching and learning process. And I've never let go of that. And uh, it very excitingly has come to fruition, I think, in, in my mind of uh, after 2020 pandemic notwithstanding, that uh, you know the, the, the future of all the things we dreamed of and predicted prior to that time through what I call random acts of progress has finally occurred. And we're to that point, you know, moving forward. And then beyond the virtual reality piece and, and passions of my own, I'm always going to be interested in technology. Um, funny enough, I'm in a high tech field and I started out in life to be a cabinet maker. Uh, and I still build some stuff when I get, get the opportunity. You're a builder. Uh, Create I things. Am. I, I, I am. I am very much so. I've actually got a kitchen in the garage right now I'm working on uh, for, in the spare time. Uh, so basically, you know, uh, I, I started out in life, like I say, to be a cabinet maker and I, through several transitions of, of 
various career opportunities and just just an amazing uh, life of of career opportunities and things that happened for me uh, i've been you know part of of becoming you know technology education teacher from the old industrial arts shop teacher and then ultimately i worked at kctcs which led me to the high tech field you know that i'm in now nice. and but beyond that uh, personally I, I have a real interest in innovation talent development and a couple of years ago, I put together a book called Dare to Change, Developing Your Innovation Talent. And it's a focus on how to teach people to think differently. And that's really what I want to do, even within the passion of, of augmented and virtual reality or extended reality, is to, to find ways to help people think differently about how we go about things, to, to get out of this, uh, what I call that'll fix it mentality of where we see a problem, we throw something at it, and we think, oh, that's the way we're going to do it, and we stay with it. And at the end of the day, we only have minimal results. And so we have to think differently uh, in terms of, of where we strive to be versus, versus you know, using technology or whatever it may be to make a change. So those are the things that, that really drive me. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Colonel Rolf Smith, U.S. Air Force, retired, wrote uh, seven levels, uh, the seven levels of change. I was one of the members of his school for innovators, and it just influenced me so much that that I, I've continued to, to look at that and explore. I do uh, some events that, that I call AVR Think Shops or just Think Shops in general to help uh, organizations or or students or other groups look at problems differently and come up with a unique way to solve those problems. So what drives me is an interest in technology, always building, creating, uh, being part of doing things differently and trying to help others along the way. Awesome. Fantastic. So I love that. So when you talk about thinking differently, what, what is that? Is that, is that counterintuitive or is there, can you go into that in a little more detail? Sure. Well, when I talk about different thinking, it's, it's, as you see behind me, it's asking those questions, why, when, where, how, <laughs> where, what, how, why, you know, all those kinds of things. And really try to look at things from outside in, uh, turn things upside down, uh, stand and look at it differently. Uh, can, uh, you know, in one of the think shop methodologies that I use, I do a situation analysis lab. And while this is corny, it really works. Uh, I have an inflatable elephant that we use. We'll pass out to the participants in the room and we ask them to identify every issue, situation or challenge that they can think of. And they paste that on the elephant because we're trying to find those things that we often overlook. Sometimes the solution to problems are right in front of us, mm -hmm. but we don't know how to look for them to find those. And we have to stop thinking of it in terms of what we know and how do we bring in what we don't know. You know, it's the old, how do you know you don't know if you don't know you don't know kind of scenario. But, but, you know, trying to find different ways to engage uh, participants or, or end users or whoever your audience may be in a process where suddenly they start thinking about things in different ways than they did prior to. Um, I do a different thinking lab uh, as well that really is, is kind of unique in its way. And it was influenced by Veritismus. I hope I pronounced the name right. There is a video out there called This Will Revolutionize Education. And the first time that I saw that, it, there's something clicked with me. And it was that uh, it was, remember when technology will uh, revolutionize education, whatever that may be, radio, television, mm -hmm. CD players, whatever. And I started thinking about that. And so in the workshop, I asked people to think of all those things that were going to revolutionize education, whether it's uh, a technology or whether it is a, a traditional application like flipped classroom or some methodology or modality of instruction. And what was pointed out to me through the video is, is that even though we've had all those advances, we are still only seeing minimal progress in changing the way we teach and the way that, that people you know learn through the teaching that's provided. And so by different thinking, we start thinking not only just plugging this in and trying it, but as we first think about where we strive to be, where do we want to be five years from now? Where do we want to be six months from now? And what should be different? You know, what's, where are we now with situation analysis to define our current state? And then from there, we start thinking differently to generate ideas, not good ideas, not bad ideas, just ideas. We don't judge at first. And then think about how that may help us go to the next level. So, you know, the journey is, is, is a journey rather than a destination. And when you do those mashups of different types of, of content and different uh, applications of, of, of events or materials or technologies with other ways of doing things, suddenly you, you, you're faced with, well, you can't do that. And, and, and then you realize, well, maybe we can. And then you start mm -hmm. coming up with new questions and ways to go with that. So different thinking is that, that being very inquisitive and, and, and just thinking differently about the problem that you have, finding a way to step aside and use some modality or methodology to, to come up with that other solution. Nice. 
So how do you stop people from thinking about the technology? Because a lot of times they go technology first as opposed to problem first or, or you know, where I want to go first. It's more like, oh, let's see how we can apply AI. It's like you don't even know if you need to apply AI. Exactly. So how do you get people out of the mindset that the technology is the, technology is the innovation? That's right. That, and that's, that's so true in education, you know, and, and you can look over, I can look over my career and you see everything from without naming any product or whatever, but whether it's a, a, a wall mounted display of some type or some other technology that uh, someone says, that'll fix it. And they, yep. they buy that technology and they go with it, whatever it may be. And, and really what you have to do first is you have to do a process. And I, I, I like to use the term situation analysis, but it's SWOT analysis. I mean, all the same tenets of design thinking or, or creative problem solving of the past are still applicable. Uh, but I like to roll things into a, a systems thinking model. And in that system thinking model, it, it, this is kind of old, but it, it still applies, is that you have five parts. You have goals. You have inputs, you have processes, outputs, and feedback, and that circle is continuous. It's a continuous improvement model. Well, if you apply that in the context of how technology can be used for change, you can suddenly start looking at things a little bit differently. So in situation analysis, you think about where, where do we want to be? What, where, what's going to be different when we, where we're in the future? Where do, we, where do we want people to be? How do we want them to be engaged? How do we want to apply that differently? And this could be in a workforce situation as well, too, or workplace situation as well. And then we start to think about what are the things we have? Where are we now? And so that's where you start thinking about, well, we use this technology, we use that technology, and you ask the question, are we getting the results we want? And the answer may be yes and no, somewhat, you know, whatever that may be, but well, how can we do it better? So then we start asking those questions, you know, why do we do it this way? Well, why did they do it that way? And often you find that we're doing things just because we have the technology. And I always like to say, I have, a, I have another old saying, I guess it's old to me anyway, is that if it fits, it fits. If it doesn't, we don't force it because we have cool tools. And so we have to start ruling out those things and find those fits. And you do that through the situation analysis, that elephant in the room process, where it engages everybody in the organization who are, or who are involved with a particular problem in a group situation. And they identify in a very short tweet size comment, this situation is a problem or whatever. And then you can prioritize those. And suddenly, as you start meshing all of those together, you start to see a trend maybe that, that you didn't see before. And then you ask the question, well, why would we use technology to do that? And how can that help us do it more effectively if we do want to use technology? And again, it's going to that process of, of uh, thinking differently of where we strive to be, not just using the tool first. We got to have the ends identified before you apply the tool to it. So the challenge as to your question is, you know, how do we get people to not just apply technology to it as the first thing? And, and that's a real challenge for, for educators, for plant managers, for whoever, you know, the end, end, end audience may be because there are lots of shiny bells and whistles on lots of technology, uh, right? So, uh, you know, maybe that does work. Maybe it does do what we want it to do. But and, and I often like to liken it to uh, having a, the app that hooks to your hot water heater and you can look at your phone and say, hey, my water heater's still at 130 degrees. <laughs> Do you really need that level of technology? And yeah. I think we're at that point in time in our history. Uh, and when I first started this journey on virtual reality, we, we had a quote from Alvin Toffler and, and Bill Gates in a white paper that we always use as our guide about, uh, you know, wh wh what the future will be. And by 2012, we were, over 2020, we were going to have refrigerators that could tell us we needed milk and we needed this and that. Mm -hmm. And all that happened, of course, years ago. So he, he was ahead of his time again, of course. But you know, do you really need that at the end of the day? And so part of my thinking in innovation talent development is that we have people who have a mindset of thinking differently, being that they ask those questions. Why do we do it this way? Would it be better if we did it? Are we better off if we go there? Are the pastures really greener on the other side? And really to kind of do those deep dives at key moments, especially dependent upon the size of the, the application that you're trying to do. You know, if you're, you're trying a technology that costs $10 and has no time involved with it. it's not it's maybe not worth the deep dive but if you're getting ready to spend millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars it would behoove you to think about you know where does this really fit and and how do we make that determination before we we implement or we purchase or we establish buy-in with our, our our clients and end users yeah it's interesting you should mention the the auto fridge concept because i i remember doing some real really recent research on it and i'm like for some reason there was a blip 
in 2015 or something like that when it was super hot and everybody was saying, oh yeah, all these devices are going to, you know, stock themselves or I'm going to call, call Instacart and, you know, ship you stuff. And then it just yeah. disappeared and it's just gone. And it's like, whatever happened to it? And it just, it seems to be, it was just sort of like a stunt or, uh, or uh, a bit of a fad. And I think right. what happened was there was a disconnect between what people wanted and what this thing was trying to do. And what we really needed. And, you know, because yeah. need yeah. is ultimately going to drive yeah. what technology is applied and how it's used. Uh, and, and to that same line, I, I recall uh, early on, we had a, a video that was shared with us of this, this guy walking through a grocery store and he's wearing a long trench coat and he's putting items in his pockets and this security guard looks at him and he walks out the door and uh, the guy says, sir, sir, sir. And he stops, the security guard stops him and the guy turns around and you thought he had stolen all this. He said, you forgot your receipt. Of course, that's with RFID, <laughs> you know, RFID technologies, you know, that were, were ultimately uh, put out there. But, you know, Again, that I haven't seen that happen yet, and I'm not going to walk in the store right now and, and grab it. And then, then we started realizing, I think also, uh, and and we see this more with our privacy concerns that that you know every door that I open, whether I've got an app that watches my water heater, my my refrigerator, my stove, my and everything can be run by that. But that's also a gateway to where someone could could enter and steal my privacy and and you know my security. And so I think. You know, it's going to be interesting in the coming years um, to see, you know, if, if people start walking away from technology a little bit or at least thinking a little bit more um, uh, closely about, about how they implement and how they use or what they really need to use technology for. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's funny because I've, I've had sort of like a, a bit of a, a revelation on that as well because I always thought that people wanted to do less, right? The people are generally lazy. Humans are pretty lazy. They want to, if you could, if you could get a system to do stuff for me, like book, book things, you know, automatically turn on my coffee maker, all that stuff. Right. But then uh, it's funny because I, I thought that that would, that's a common thing. But then we talk to millennials and Gen Z, they go, oh, well, well I'm concerned about that. It's going to be creepy or there's privacy issues and stuff like that. And I'm like, wow, don't you want these things to do it for you? And they're like, no, you know, I'd much rather uh, keep my private information. So it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting disconnect between, you know, what you think people want and what people actually want. Right, right, right. I, I agree totally. You know, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just an interesting, it's an interesting time to live, you know, with everything from Alexa to Siri to Cortana to, uh, you know, all the devices and things that you use. And then suddenly you feel like I'm not alone and maybe I am alone. <laughs> and, yeah. and I think another challenge, <laughs> another challenge. A bunch of programmers that, are listening in on you right yeah, now. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's just interesting to think, you know, how, how exposed you are. And, and a lot of people, you know, they ask the question who, who are non-tech savvy, and, and that is, well, I was looking yesterday at buying a refrigerator and I went on Facebook tonight and all of a sudden ads on refrigerators appeared or I'm using yeah. Google. Why did that happen? And that's, yeah. I think people are starting to realize that now. And, yeah. and with all the upheaval that's going on in the world, you know, I think there's, there's higher concerns amongst, amongst everyone. So we'll see where that, that goes. Yeah, that's happened to me too. And I'm like, I'm sure I did not surf for this. I'm sure I was just talking to somebody about it or was listening or I, it's like I thought about and, and it I, it must be reading I wonder my sometimes I wonder sometimes you know if I I think sometimes I haven't been around technology and all of a sudden the same thing happens so you know, uh, so who knows but uh, so it, it me, is it, go ahead no, go ahead so t tell me so, so you're talking about you said one of your things that you, one of the key things that you want to do is innovation talent development can you go into that a little more detail I mean what do you mean by innovation talent all right, I, I believe, and, and you can argue this point one way or the other, but I, I believe everyone has the ability to be innovative and creative if they just know how to unleash it. You know, we all, it's, it's like we all learn differently and in different ways and at different rates. I think we can also be innovative in different ways and at different rates. And, and if I can help you unleash your innovation talent, being that there's a process or, or a system of tools that you can use in your personal life and in your work life that can help you, uh, uh, you know, you do some strategies that just make you, again, think differently, to overuse my cliche word here, but, but to look at things in, in ways that suddenly awaken your ability to come up with new solutions. So whether it's a situation analysis, whether it's uh, carrying a, a tool I call idea catchers, and I actually stole that from Rolf Smith, which are blue slips, but basically pieces of paper that you cut to a little bit smaller than a note size card. In the top left corner, you put an idea you have maybe, uh, and, and then you write a tweet size note of what that idea is. Because half of innovation is 
two things are making up really good innovation to me. One is observation, uh, looking at, at how things work, having in, you know that desire to wonder how they work and, and, and so forth. And then the other is capturing those ideas. And in my book, I put together a couple of scenarios or stories about innovators that, that maybe people do, do or do not know about. Uh, and, and so, you know, to develop the innovation talent is, is just help people th first realize that, you know, I can come up with a different idea. I can come up with a different way of doing it. And also, if I can at least help put aside this that'll fix it mindset and, and start asking questions like, I wonder if I could do it this way. And, and how else could we do that? Or why did they do it that way? Could I make it better? And just help develop that much of it. I think we can help people uh, be more innovative and creative. And, and I think in our workforce, uh, if, if we have team members in whatever industry they are who are observant, who capture those ideas they have and provide their feedback and feel comfortable enough to provide their feedback, that suddenly we can start looking at ways uh, organically, really, to transform our industries, our, our education education process, process to be more effective at, at finding solutions and creative things. Uh, I believe, you know, America is the home of entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, all you have to do is look at the pandemic, how many new ideas came out with people from making masks to whatever to try to resolve and do something with the problem. So innovation talent is just that ability uh, that somebody has to apply a process or it's something that they've learned uh, and to develop this interest in this this inquisitiveness in their own attitude about how things work to try to think how they can make it better yeah no and i agree with you 100 percent that the creativity is there in in everybody and it just needs to be unleashed somehow and and um pulling it out I think pulling it out, it's, it's so great because when you can see that the, the ideas sort of popping and you can see, you know, their, their minds churning and they're like, mm -hmm. you know, wow, this is great. This is great. This is great. Now, unfortunately, in most corporates, there's a flip side to that. You come out, you've come out and you create all these great ideas and they're phenomenal and you filter them down and then nothing happens. How do you, how do you help moving? <laughs> how do you help to move these great ideas through through an organization and turn them into something real? Uh, I, I've created a course on how to cuss in four different languages for those who are frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> <I can do that. laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it, it's part of a, in, in the process in a corporate environment is that you, you help uh, help, help individuals, you know, get the ideas out there. And there, there becomes this kind of consensus that evolves when you see the trend that goes across the group or the team. And where I'm coming from with that, I had one experience that I ran a think shop with uh, one of the colleges here in Kentucky. And uh, we had 475 of the faculty first day of school. And we did the elephant in the room uh, routine with them. And we asked them to identify the top, you know, as many issues as you possibly can that this college needs to solve in this academic year. And it was interesting that everybody filled out. We had 25 elephants with hundreds of, of you know, little tiny post-it note tags on them. Oh, you the very small those in bulk? Yes. <laughs> 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 and, and you know what? Uh, it, it's funny, you could do it with technology and it would probably be easier, but there was a certain part of the process of having someone take that little post-it note and, and condense their thoughts down to that smallest little bit of what they wanted to say and place it on that and then stick that on the elephant. And so then what we had was we had 25 elephants. Uh, they're a little inflatable. They're maybe 12 inches, you know, in, in circumference. Uh, and, and we took all those up front. Then we took those to different tables and different groups and we asked them to write down the list just so they could synthesize and eliminate duplications. And then we trained those lists around and we ask everyone in the group to to identify what they think were their top priorities and after an hour and a half we had two top priorities that were identified by consensus vote of the entire faculty that they needed to work on which was recruit a retention of students they were dealing with major issues with retention and mm -hmm. and so the question was that i had to the faculty was when was the last time you went to a full faculty meeting and that everyone in the meeting had an opportunity to provide some input on a challenge of where we needed to go as an organization and nobody raised their hand and i said well that's history because we just used a process to unlock your innovation talent if you will uh, yeah. to to come up with identifying those things that everybody sees as the common problem that we didn't all realize or think about walking in the door that morning as the common problem.
And one one participant in that group came back to us a year later and said, you know, after doing that, my retention was at 75 percent in this nursing program. And after I stepped up my game and I started applying some different strategies to how I taught, my retention rate has been 99 percent for the last four years. And I hope that she's still at that level, you know, here eight years later from when we did that workshop. So the power of that kind of process to change just even just the morale or or the feeling of inclusiveness you know everybody feels included in that process because technically it's anonymous and and you know we had one or two stickers that said i don't like doing this you know they had some comment and I, like later at the end of the day i think they felt bad nobody knew who it was but they felt bad because i missed my chance to input on how things could be better yeah. and so the next time you try it you know it grows and it builds out so you know, that's that's one of the things that you have happen. And again, uh, it's not that it's going to be that'll fix it. It's a journey of where we strive to be. So it's 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 kind of it's not a moving target, but it's kind of a, a place that we're all working together to get to. And, and along the way, you're going to change and you're going to revise that vision as needed using maybe the same kind of process. But, you know, over time, you could drastically change the way you operate because you're getting input sometimes from from people who may not be in the most prominent position, but they really know what's going on, maybe more than the management or the leadership or, or you know, another person on the team knows. Uh, so I think it's very valuable to as team building, but also as a as means to, to find creative ways to solve problems. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that it sounded like you, you actually ended up with a problem in the end, right? Like they, they, they honed on, like this is a key thing that we need to do is work on retention. What, mm -hmm. Did you actually have ideas on retention at the same time, or did you then go into a diver diverge session? We, we did. We, we, we did the next stage of the workshop, which was basically that situation analysis again. And so then it was, think of every idea you could possibly come up with that would improve retention. Right. Not a good idea, not a bad idea, just an idea. Deferred judgment, throw away preconceived notions when you walk in the door. And then from there, we do the different thinking workshop and start doing some things like mashups of where you can put a technology, maybe it's for a projector and a desk and make mm -hmm. something new out of that. And suddenly this, well, wow, I, you know, that's how do I do that? And then it, it challenges them to start thinking differently right then to be more innovative. And so we've, we've had some, some pretty good success in the times that I've run those. So when you, when you come up with these ideas and uh, do you ever get a lot of, I mean, I'm assuming there's pushback sometimes like, oh, we can't do that or it's not, or we've tried that before. It's not going to work. How do you, how do you help move those through? Do you just like uh, ask them to experiment or what's the best way? Well, uh, of course, uh, that's, that's part of, of the process. And so when, when you, first of all, when you organize coming up with a solution to that problem, let's say it's retention. The first thing you do is you define the current state, you know, where are we now? Uh, you know, and then you start asking this question, why are we doing it that way? What, you know, and then ultimately, at, after you define the current state, you define where, where you want to be. And in the meantime, I'm asking them to uh, parking lot those pushback items, those things. You can't do it because of the budget. Can't do it. I say, don't worry about that right now. Yeah. We'll, we'll solve that as another piece. And so we, we well, know where whenever, we are. Whenever, whenever I do that, they always say, oh, we're, we're, we're moving into the land of make-believe, are we? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and you... Yes. You agree, yes, you agree we are. with them. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. But why don't we see if we can't do something? And, and often I've, I've shared with them, you know, the, the one technique in, in innovation and talent development is the crazy idea. Hmm. Uh, and that's, that's the one of the most far out, outrageous thing you could possibly come up with. And you throw it out there as an idea. Yep. And everybody, wow, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. And suddenly everybody's making fun of it, having a good time. Poking, you know, but then somebody says, "Well, you know what? What if you did that with this crazy idea they had?" And suddenly somebody says, "Well, why couldn't we do that?" And then yeah. you start sparking ideas, and it happens. I, you know, I have a story that that uh, Ralph Ralph Smith shared with us when he worked with Exxon that that kind of led to that, uh, which was basically uh, it was after Exxon Valdez thing happened. I won't go into the whole story, but basically they did that crazy idea. And the, the idea was that uh, one of the members said, what if, you know, uh, Christ came down from heaven and said it wasn't the Exxon Valdez, it was an act of my father. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> creative way of saying it. And everyone looked at the guy and teased him and said, are you crazy? And 
And he and then somebody says, well, we can't get Christ, but we can get uh, Tom Cruise. <laughs> and so they said, what? Yeah. So and so it's it's out here online yet. The Days of Thunder, down. the Days of Thunder movie. And and if you'll watch the trailer and if you'll watch the movie, you'll notice that in the trailer everything was branded Exxon. In the movie, Exxon didn't appear. And and basically it changed their whole demographic. And and it turned around the problem that they had from that that tragedy and you know, economically for Exxon was a good thing. So the crazy idea is one approach. So there, there's, there's, we have kind of a toolkit put together uh, and, and I've been working on that uh, for quite a while of just different ways to, to help people come up with, with ideas and solutions. So it's idea generation techniques. It's mm-hmm. everything from, you know, what I call the idea catchers, the little slips to, to these uh, situation analysis labs, to uh, different lenses, you know, it's looking at things from different perspectives of different people in an organization. Like there was an ad application out there, I saw one called Six Thinking Hats, and everybody puts on mm-hmm. a hat that, you know, some role playing, some of those kind of things. So there's there's a number of things that you can do to help solve that, and, and you may come up with a quick solution, or you may not. But along the way, you've learned some things that you can apply. So if it's not a destination but a journey. You always have some um, modem, a modicum of success in your implementation of trying to do this strategy for, for developing innovation talent. Uh, one of the things that I think that plays very well into is agile project management methodology. Uh, mm-hmm. And as I've had more experience with that, I, I really see that, you know, when you do sprints, uh, you could almost liken this to a sprint in, in uh, project management being that at the end of every sprint, you have a potentially deliverable product. Yeah. So if, if you do an agile thinking process at the same time that you're doing this innovation uh, development piece and you kind of each innovative piece of that is a sprint, ultimately you may wind up with the bigger solution that, that you were after. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to do a quick segue into some of the other stuff that you talked about in your email is uh, you mentioned earlier XR and VR and AR and what, what do you, I mean, Obviously, this like, what do you think is, I mean, is, is, is XR not just augmented reality? I mean, what makes it different? Well, it, it's it's a blending of, of all VR and AR and, and other uh, technologies. So, you know, you can throw some, some artificial intelligence in there also. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier that uh, one of the things that, that has really changed uh, since, since 2020 is that, you know, uh, we had the pandemic, but, you know, prior to that time, uh, and we we talked about how you could use, and, and I say we collectively as partners, we had in Kentucky, external Kentucky, and, our, and, and my long-term partnership and friendship with the Eon Reality, uh, or of different ways that you could use VR to improve education. And in 2008 or so, we created uh, in Kentucky an application for the Kentucky Coal Academy. Uh, on how to use a self-contained self-breathing apparatus for underground coal miners. And it was post-SEGO West Virginia disaster and training turned out to be not very good on that. So uh, we were charged with developing an application on uh, that rescuer. So I did a VR application, had instructor's guide, student guides, and a CD, if you remember those, that, that people would put into a tray and it upload a viewer oh, yeah. and they would play it, you know, in this 3D simulation in 2008 on, on their computers. Well, the problem with that was that uh, even though I won top three awards from the U.S. Mine Health and Safety Administration that year, Kentucky KCTCS did, uh, we didn't have any users of any real note. And the problem was that people had trouble installing the viewer. Their computer wasn't fast enough. It wasn't powerful enough. And But we had vision of all that time of, of ways that we can use that technology. And so did many universities across the globe. Uh, and there were lots of, of what I call random acts of progress prior to 2020. And I don't mean that in a downplay way, though they were very successful. There have been a lot of great things done with, with virtual reality and augmented reality now. But it all came together to me in, in December of 2019 when I did a demonstration for a, a class of students at Mohawk College. And uh, suddenly I built this lesson, I shared it with them immediately, and it was just a model on a fishing reel of all things, just as a demonstration uh, inside the Eon XR platform. And I went back and I opened up that same lesson about 10 minutes later in a head mount display. And like I'd gone into this environment, this world, and it didn't require me to have programming skills or all that knowledge, you know, to do that. So post 2020, it hit me that, that all the things we were trying to do in 25, 2002 through 2010 for me in, in that role, we can finally do. I mean, I was like, I felt complete, <laughs> you know, it's here, we can do it. But what's different now 
than 2020 before. And, and let's throw out the pandemic because that even changed it even more. But mm. in 2020 post, we have 5G networks that are coming to fruition. So it's now easier to push more data across network systems than, than we could before. Uh, we have uh, artificial intelligence, which can interact with users and learners and build upon their knowledge and background and, you know, all the type things that you've, you've seen with that. Uh, virtual reality is getting more commonplace and easier to do. So now we have uh, Oculus Quest, Quest 2, HTC Vive, and, and a number of other head mount displays that, that can also do the same thing thing. Uh, we have uh, virtual or augmented reality. So if you think of the interest of Pokemon Go, but the fact that everyone has a cell phone, a smartphone now that's powerful enough to run an augmented application, and we see it in, in all facets of life right now, there's lots of places that you'll see AR, that potential is greater. So you have HoloLens 2 and Magic Leap uh, tools like that that can make it more uh, user-friendly and able to do. But the really good news is that all the content that was created in, in 3D models, for example, CAD models and other, other formats, can be grabbed now from everything that was done those random acts of progress and still be used today in many mm -hmm. cases where it's applicable. Build that app, build it once, deploy it in many times. So once you create it, uh, you share it immediately and someone can play it on their cell phone, their tablet, their PC, their head mount display in an augmented reality mode or virtual reality mode and or a mix of both where you've got virtual reality and augmented laid over top, uh, the real world laid into the virtual world environment. So mm -hmm. the time now is going forward is, is really different. And the expectation of, of everyone is that we're all connected to our cell phones, you know, 24 seven when nobody admits it. If they hear it buzz in the middle of the night, they'll probably get up and check and see that, you know, there's a message from somebody in, in one of those ads yeah. like we talked about earlier. Uh, so What's different now is that all that comes together. And so now with extended reality, uh, we, we and being that it's an inclusion of all of those, is that you can create content both for teaching and learning, but also for workforce training, for upskilling, uh, for engaging uh, employees and customers even in different ways. So the capacity here to share it. And, and that's the most important thing because there's no, you know, if tree falls in woods that make it sound, but if you build an application, you can't share it with anybody, does it have any value? Yeah. So we're at a point now, uh, and, and I think, and that's one of the things that I have to, to say about the, the XR platform that Eon has developed is that it, it is giving us that capacity to really engage people in different ways. And so innovative teachers and faculty or, or business trainers or workforce managers, whatever they may be, can find unique ways to train some on technical content, for example, via online instruction. And that's where the pandemic comes in. Everything went online. Everybody's working from home. Uh, mm -hmm. So now if I could give you a demonstration, I'm, say I'm a welding teacher and I record a video of my lecture on welding guns. And then I say, open this app on, on welding gun and you can interact with it. You can res it in your living room. We can actually have a meeting with the whole class inside of that app around that model and application and have a virtual class in, in a more real way than just looking at boxes like you typically do in, in, in Zoom and meet meetings that we're, we're used to now. So, nice. you know, XR has the potential to really change the way that, that, that we engage uh, with, with students and in our workplace and the way that we learn and learn more, more quickly, more effectively to, to apply skills that we may not have access to in the real world in the classroom or even, you know, with certain tools and devices. So do you need special devices to use this or can you, like you see, you mentioned a, sm a smartphone. Is that all you need, really? That's, to be able that's to really, smart? that's the yes. truth. That's the cool thing uh, about it. You, If you have, now, there are a plethora <laughs> of cell phones out there, so there may be some variations, but for the most part, the most the most current uh, devices that are on the market right now, you can do AR, you can do VR with uh, Google Glass, Google Box, uh, you know, uh, or um, Hamido glasses. Uh, so you can get a cheap virtual reality experience off of that. You can play it, and and the thing about it is, you can actually even build this training on your phone while you're on the train riding back to that apartment uh, in the afternoon and share that app with others uh, so and, and so it's just amazing that it doesn't take anything special it's device agnostic uh, so we can work with those those magic leaps the hollow ends and and you know the numbers of head mount displays that are out there uh, you know there may be some tweaking or whatever that that might have come along with certain devices that are new but but we're we work to keep keep up with changes in the technology that are coming along with that but that's what's all different is that now 
the technologies have aligned, the hardware has aligned, the, the desire and the need has aligned in, you know, post-2020 and into 2021, it's going to be interesting to see where it goes from here. Yeah. Well, I, I'm doing the uh, Stanford MBA program, uh, and they, it's all online now. And they have this, this tool called Verbella, which is like a 3D environment. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But they tried to have, they tried to have classes in the environment, and it was terrible. I mean, it was almost impossible to like it was difficult to walk around. Right. And I mean, they had replicated the Stanford campus, and you're supposed to try and <laughs> I, I went I tried to get to a meeting there, and it was just like, how do I find this place? And it was it was very confusing. How do I sit down? How do I do this? So it's very unintuitive. And I'm assuming right. what you're doing now is a way a lot more intuitive, or a lot easier to work well, with. It, it's much easier to work with, and and it's you know. It, there's this thing about environment and then sometimes it, it doesn't matter. It's use, it's using the object itself in, in the case of, of a, you know, 3D object that you build a lesson around that the activities that you do around that object, this may be the focal point for you to attach, embed lots of other instruction and, and not worry so much about the environment. And, and I had the same experience as, as you with, with Vellum uh, in, you may recall, uh, 2006 range, you know, second life, had been around, but I, we'd heard oh, about yeah. Second Life was going to revolutionize everything. And I remember I, I set up a Second Life account and I went into uh, one of the big universities. I don't remember which one it was. And, and the campus was replicated. Oh, my avatar could walk around. I could see it. And oh, here were the, the serpentines for me to stand in line at the admissions office. And over here, and then you walk into this big, you know, uh, classroom with your avatar and this avatar professor comes out and does the lecture. So did that bring benefit to it? Not at all. And that's why that, that you know, kind of went away. It, it was the concept was all right in the immersion in the environment is very powerful. And, and even if you're playing through that third person role play, it does have a value. But do you really need to replicate all those things or you, can you put someone into an experience that they can't travel to? And, and so uh, what has to be different with all this, and that's where the creative piece comes in. Uh, I'll give you this example of something that, that we have been sharing a lot uh, at Eon is that what I call self-directed learning. And I've done this uh, all of my teaching career uh, using a design brief model. So even when I taught woodworking, I did this, this same kind of thing, which is basically you give students a scenario of a problem that they're to solve. And there's three things that happen using this platform to do that. There's research, there's creating application and presenting the application. So what we recommend as one instructional modality is that uh, you give the students a scenario and in that scenario they're to solve a problem of some type and, and I, I did this with the class I said well you're you're working at a hospital as a tech support person and, and this this pandemic comes along imagine that but you need to train people uh, give some apps to train people how to do certain things quickly using virtual reality or augmented reality and so then their challenge was to build a model or do some research on a topic so I had one student did research on backboarding a patient just a standard CPR thing all right so that's that research research is the first exposure to learning. Then they created an application where they took that research and, and put it into a 3D application to create this backboard and, and a training around that. That's a second very powerful re reinforcement of the learning that took place from the research. So they had to take what they learned in research, figure out how to synthesize that into a way to teach others to do it. And then lastly, they do a presentation to their classmates inside the app or just by creating the app. And then that reinforcement of teaching it is a third piece that they should become very comfortable with what it was they learned to do. So that scenario-based learning being self-directed. And so where the platform is so user-friendly, uh, you can grab a, an object, uh, an asset, a 3D model, typically from 3DS Max or even Blender or FBX files or CAD files that can be converted. You can create the application and then you can creatively come up with ways to build content around that. And then the moment that you're finished, you can send a link to a group and everyone can get that at the same time. They can join in a meeting inside the app on it, or they can also, uh, you know, just interface with it just on a one-on-one -on -one basis whenever or wherever they are. And that's the other advantage to this is that, uh, you know, education can happen not just in between the hours of eight and three. It can happen anytime, 24 hours a day, 24-7, and it can happen in your own environment. There, there's something to think about when you're learning about something, if you're sitting in your kitchen and all of a sudden you res this machine on the table, that you could typically only see in your in your lab in a career technical education situation. And now I can take it apart. I can manipulate it. I can assess. I can watch a demonstration from 
my instructor that shows me a sequence for taking things apart. And then I try to repeat that sequence and get a score as soon as I'm finished that, you know, I, I missed seven steps and only got 85% of it correct or whatever. Uh, very, very powerful potential for the future. And so where that comes in from an innovation standpoint is that creative ways of using this technology are, are uh, abundant and you just have to think differently, right, about yeah. how you want to teach and engage students in using the process. Absolutely. And I think that the other key piece is that, you know, as can be seen by the examples that we, we both mentioned, we, can, we shouldn't just replicate the real world. We have to do better than real world because we can use the technology to make the experience better than better than being there. And that's what I think a lot of a lot of people are like, oh, we have to make the remote experience the same as as being in person. I'm like, no, 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 we need to go. We need to go beyond that. There's so many elements of the remote experience that make things better that you know, focus on those elements. Don't, don't try to replicate right. reality. Try to create uh, something better than reality. Exactly. And so, you know, thank you for that because that's different thinking. <laughs> it's, it's getting rid of those preconceived notions. Yeah. Uh, this is the way we have to do it. This is the way we've always done it. This is the way it has to be. And yeah. it's, it's a, a mindset of not accepting that. Uh, it's it's a mindset of, of scientific, uh, you know, thinking of, of asking the five whys or, you know, just keep asking questions and thinking about how you can do it differently. And, and so you don't have to be in a, a lab to, to teach something. You can do it in different ways. You know, eventually you may get to where you actually need to put hands on a real piece of equipment or a real machine. But if yeah. you can shorten the cycle time of learning, that time of being a beginning employee to a more high performing employee uh, is, is going to be reduced quite dramatically by using simulation based learning or, or some of these uh, scenario based learning uh, methods using this platform that it can it can be a, a, a real game changer in, in developing your skills and abilities. And then there's one other piece that I like to talk about, and I, I picked this up from years ago, and I'm not sure who who the author was, but uh, I, I talk about the concept of developing your adaptive expertise, that building upon any set of knowledge that you gain from any life experience and how you can apply that within the context of another occupation or another career another process. And it's very important for all of us to always look at ways to improve our, our own adaptive expertise to be able to adapt to situations as they arise, especially true now here as we look at the pandemic, you know, I, I think probably a lot of people are looking, well, what can I do now? Uh, what have I done in the past to help me get through this? How can I use that to get through this part? Or how can we change and adapt? And and we, we really have to think about that as, as we go forward and how we use past knowledge and not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but also think that we can do things in different ways. But how do we transition to get there? And that's that's the real challenge of, of any innovation as you go forward. Exactly. Exactly. So let's uh, let's it's foresight time. Where will the world be in 2031? <laughs> okay. <Here's that. laughs> good. Good question, right? So, well, okay. I think what needs to happen and what concerns me uh, is that we do need to to be able to ask those questions. We we can no longer we can't. And I'm worried about a trend of of at least at this point in time that it's difficult for people to question why we do things the way we do them, or if you question any, any one event. And if you don't question uh, to a certain degree and feel safe to question, then, you know, how are you going to make a change and make it better? So that's what concerns me. So looking at long term, so 10 years from now, uh, you know, I think that there hopefully will be a better blend of, of uh, human interface with computers and technology in that it's used for more uh, purposeful applications, whether it's for training or whether it's for uh, expanding knowledge or managing systems or, or being used as part of a process. Uh, to solve problems. And so if, if that is the case, uh, I think as, as we've always seen uh, over our lifetimes, the, the rate of technology and the change and advancement, there are new ideas and new things that will come along that no one could imagine, or there may be problems that can ultimately be solved. Um, for me, innovation, the ability to do things, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, uh, it, the, the capacity to innovate 
uh, to be able to create all those those factors that are there from science, from knowledge, from whatever have always been around. It's just someone has to be the next person that's creative enough to do those in a different way. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you can say uh, the the ancient Egyptians could have had uh, jet fighters in you know when they were building the pyramids, and and if you watch ancient aliens, maybe they did, but uh, <laughs> the capacity was there. The, 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 you know, the materials were there, the, the, all the science, all the physics, all those things, you know, they're never going to repeal the laws of physics, right? So all those things are there for innovation to change. So that opens the door for the future. And, and so my worry to the future is more so that innovators, we, we lose people having this, this inquisitive need of wanting to know why things work the way they do and how we could make it better and not being afraid to ask questions that can get us beyond preconceived notions of solutions to uh, the crazy idea that spawns something else that lets us come up with a different way of doing things. Uh, so I, I think if you look at big government, big operational things, it's always, well, we're going to put all of our ducks into this this row and all of our eggs in this basket for a good analogy yeah, again. Yeah. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, you know, we're going to get more of the same of what we've always had. We're, we may make some incremental improvement, but it doesn't really change things. It doesn't fix the climate. It doesn't, it doesn't fix, you know, uh, unemployment or whatever the issue may be. So yeah. we, we have to look at things uh, realistically. Uh, if, if the technology fits, it fits. If it doesn't, we don't force it because we have cool tools. Uh, so, you know, all those factors, I think, need to play into what the future will be. So I guess I'm not really giving you an answer of where I think the world will be in 10 years, but I think that we will have flying cars and we'll have flying uh, drones that you can ride around yourself. And <laughs> yeah, that's what I want. I'm like, isn't it easier to have a flying car than it is to have a, an autonomous vehicle on the road? I mean, there's less stuff up there, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And can we teleport rather than fly? And, uh, you know, I mean, teleportation, that's a crazy idea, but you can do it in the virtual world. How, you know, yeah, may, no, who right? knows, you know? So that next crazy idea may happen. So, you know, to be optimistic for the future, I do think that, you know, there are uh, some innovators out there yet, like there have been in the past. You know, Elon Musk is is a good example uh, of someone, but there's always been somebody along the way that that you don't even think about uh, who created something that that suddenly changed the world, but you don't really know who they were or or how that happened, you know. And I I cite those stories in my book from uh, Sister Tabitha Babbitt, who was uh, one of the American shakers who invented the circular saw blade. And, and, you know, that was just from watching her spinning wheel and, and watching uh, them saw lumber in a, in a lumber pit the traditional way. She came up with an idea to put teeth on a, on a wheel and grind that into a saw blade. Or, you know, uh, the, the Betty Nismith who created liquid paper or, you know, uh, others who, who did some really unique things. Just from looking at and asking a question, how could we do that better? And so from okay. that, that's what the future will be defined by if we have enough of those innovators. Yeah. And they're out there. We just need to bring them out. <laughs> we do. We do. Well, we need to let people feel empowered and and free enough to to ask why. And and in in any environment, you know, whether it's in their school, in their workplace, uh, in any you know aspect of of role that they have, that we ask why do we do it this way? How can we do it better? You know, where are we going to go from here? Where do we want to be in the future? And then let's work together to get there. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. This has been this has been amazing. Uh, tell me how somebody if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Well, uh, the best way I guess would be probably you can go to uh, Eon Reality's website and to get more information specifically on the XR platform, uh, and you can link to me and our team from there. And actually, you can get a freemium account to try that out. Uh, if you are interested in innovation, I've just put up, it's not a very good website right now, but it's uh, thinkdifferently.us. And then I guess also I can give you my email address uh, that we can use for this, which is jmsjustice at gmail.com. Nice. Well, I'll, I'll get all your bio and information. I'll put it in the show notes. So if anybody wants to get in touch with you, sure and, uh, we'll go from there. So thank you so much, sir. This has been great. Hey, great. great. I had a great time. Thank you for allowing me to be part of it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Talk to you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.